move into our panel discussion, and I'd like to have the panelists come up at this point. We have Dr. Sharon Bremner, the Director of Pupil Personnel Services from East Hartford Public Schools. Sharon. We have the District Partnership Coordinator for Middletown Public Schools, Donna Marina. And from the New Haven Public Schools, we have the Principal of Lincoln Bassett School, Janet Brown Clayton. Please welcome them. We've asked each of our panelists to take a few minutes to introduce themselves. So if we'd like to begin, Sharon, would you like to begin? Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I don't know. I started my career in 1978 as a special education teacher with Unified School District Number 3. I instructed students with significant multi uh, multiple disabilities. It's green. It's a green. Can you hear me now? Okay. I'll start again. Good morning, everyone. I began my career in 1978 uh, as a special education teacher with Unified School District number three. I provided instruction to students with significant multiple disabilities. Uh, while in Unified School District, I also served as a program coordinator and a secondary transition coordinator where I was able to travel throughout the western part of the state working with multiple families and students and high school staff to uh, serve the needs of students with uh, disabilities. Um, from there, I served as the special education director for our area RESC, Education Connection, and then moved over to a small uh, rural district, Region 6, for a little bit before arriving in East Hartford Public Schools, where I'm very proud to serve with the greatest team of teachers, administrators, and families and kids. I'm in my seventh year there and, and very happy. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here, and I really thank you for having me. I've been the district partnership coordinator in Middletown for the past 20 years. And um, Middletown is a, a small urban district. About 50% of our population is on free and reduced lunch. Um, and this is a second career for me. My first career was in business as a computer programmer and a systems analyst. Um, and I'd like to say that um, my career changed when I had my first child. Um, when he was little, he was diagnosed with some special needs. And so I became involved in the special education process. And um, I took a course at CERC called Going for the Gold. And, um, I oversee parent leadership now for Middletown and Middlesex County, but back then when I took this course, Going for the Gold, it was very similar to what we're offering now in Connecticut, and like I say about parent leadership now, um, it was life-changing for me. So I changed my career, I got more involved, um, but it taught me the skills I needed to be an advocate for my child, to be comfortable sitting at those decision-making tables, um, I, I sat at many decision-making tables in business, but the PPT process is, is much, more, much different, and I definitely needed some tools to communicate better, to problem-solve, to really understand the law and the process, and, and to learn how to develop partnerships with a team that was going to be um, helping my child. And, um, and he's become, he's 26, 28 years old now, very successful. His uh, special education teacher actually attended his high school graduation. Uh, we still get together once a year. Um, so we did form a, a true partnership. And um, I can't say enough about um, helping families to really get to know you and for you to get to know families um, as, as special education um, leaders in, in our state. Because um, it was life-changing for me, for my child, um, and in now I help other parents become leading advocates for children and I facilitate um, parent leadership throughout the state to give them the t tools to be comfortable 
sitting at those decision-making tables, to be able to speak up and um, act as you, you know, parents are their children's first educators, but we need the tools to um, communicate that effectively. Because, you know, many parents, I'm sure you see, communicate, but is, is it effective? And one of the things we do at Parent Leadership is um, teach them effective communication skills. One of the things we talk a lot about a lot with parents to help them is I over E, intelligence over emotion. We are passionate about our children. They're our babies. Um, but we need to bring that passion to the table, show we care, but we also have to bring some facts, some data, some intelligence, and balance that out so that our children can be as successful as they can be. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Donna. Jen? Good morning. I don't think you'll have a problem hearing me. <laughs> My name is Janet Brown Clayton. I'm the very proud principal of Lincoln Bassett Community School where eagles soar and failure is not an option. I began my career much like Donna. Um, my foray into education was a change of careers as well. I worked with adjudicated status offenders, and um, my dad named me after the only two African-American educators he knew. So my name is Janet Felicia. And he always told me, you could go far, baby. You could even be a principal one day. Um, I am blessed to work in the community in which I grew up. Um, I, my father ceased education at eighth grade. My mom graduated high school at 16, married my dad at 17, had me at 18, had all of us by the time she was 25, and then went to college. Um, she taught for 40 years. And I am passionate about education because I want to do for my children what was done for me. And that is to broaden their scope about themselves, where they can go and what they can do. Um, I'm very happy to be a part of this panel as well because I have a son um, who was my 40th birthday surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah. <laughs> and he was diagnosed in the inter utero, um, Down syndrome, spinal bifida, heart defects, lung defects. And I am thankful to God that I chose not to listen to what they said. I chose to feed my faith and starve my doubts. And he is now a high school graduate coming through um, the New Haven public school system, uh, graduated 16 out of 198 students received the New Haven Promise Scholarship, and is working on his 13th credit at Gateway Community College where he's majoring in early childhood special education with the intent to graduate and go to Southern majoring in math. So I'm a very proud mama. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as you can see, we have quite an uh, exciting panel. And uh, we met a couple of times uh, to talk about how we wanted to make this happen. And initially, we actually uh, toyed with the idea of having each one of the uh, individuals do a presentation. But uh, our first visit, as we began uh, our conversations, we had, well, Gosh, it must have been well over a two-hour uh, conversation, I would say. And it was so invigorating, so exciting, um, so enjoyable that um, I suggested that maybe what we should do is see if there was some way in which you all could be part of that conversation. And so we came up with this idea of having um, this kind of coffee table dialogue. Um, and rather than doing just a presentation, 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 that we have an opportunity to just have this uh, give and take t discussion and have, and as if we're just having, um, not coffee, water, and, um, and just having a discussion and, and conversation and make believe that you're not there, but you're listening. So um, the theme or the, uh, uh, the initial uh, prompt was what strategies do you implement in your district and schools to engage families, specifically parents of children with disabilities? Well, um, 
we are part of the Commissioner's Network School. We were a failing school, um, and so we're a turnaround school. And what was very important to me, um, given the fact that 12% of our population and that percentage continues to increase, was special education, was that I created a climate um, and a culture where parents were partners in their children's education. And when I say that, I mean, um, I know that uh, Dr. Rodriguez has been saying that uh, consistently this morning, but given that, and, and this is an authentic conversation and a courageous conversation, but given that my school is 85 to 90% African American and the overwhelming uh, percentage of the students represented in special education in my school is African American and that my staff is the antithesis of that, but they are an extraordinarily gifted group of educators that we've been able to build a culture around courageous conversations and addressing race and understanding that what my children's experiences are will not be or may not be what my staff's experiences are. And then making certain that my special education staff, while they are highly trained, highly educated, when we go into PPTs, we leave our egos at the door. Uh, that I purposely sit next to the parent and make certain that if I feel that there's something that's said that's not understandable, that I speak in layman's terms. So we d deliberately do away with, you know, I call it the alphabet soup, where we just throw out, you know, acronyms and expect our parents to understand them. We don't do that. We take the time to make certain that we are engaging our parents, even in terms of calling them before they come in for a PPT, to meet and to talk about the results of testing because quite frankly, our children, it's a hard task, having been the parent sitting on the other side of the table, to hear what's wrong with your child. You know, and, and to have somebody tell you that your baby might not be perfect, or that there's something that's been diagnosed through testing that will let you know that there is some additional help your child needs. So we've built our culture around making certain that our parents are comfortable knowing that no matter what the disability may be, your child's education and the concern for you is going to be top notch and top quality all the way. Thank you, Janet. You also did, did some work um, with the facility as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, we, my philosophy, and I'm so glad that my staff shares it with me, is that when you're inviting someone to your house, you make certain you prepare. And so there were some facility problems <clears throat> that needed to be corrected. For instance, the, wrap, the ramp, because of the snow and the ice and the sand and all, was just decaying, and so we had to have that fixed. We had to have our lift fixed. Um, we had to make certain that our building was accessible and welcoming to all of our special needs students, and to just make certain that even our parents, who are sometimes on walkers, crutches, they're able to get into our building as well. Thank you. Sharon, you did something similar too. That, yes, that didn't you? <clears throat> absolutely. In East Hartford, we also, we are an Alliance District and two of our schools are Commissioner's Network schools. And as a means of making our schools more welcoming and comfortable for our families, we have a program called 20 Steps. And several of our buildings have undergone facilities renovations. Um, and it, it includes making sure that the yard areas are, uh, the, the grass is planted, we have new trees planted, there are pavers uh, that have been put in as walkways, that our buildings are accessible, so that the first 20 steps of family, uh, as they move toward a building, they're feeling comfortable and welcome. And it extends to the way the families are greeted when they walk into a building. We've all walked into school buildings in our careers that we're not real familiar with, and, and I experienced this as a transition coordinator in multiple high schools. You get a feel for the building the minute you walk in the door. It can be as simple as how staff greet you in the hallway or how the secretary greets you when you walk into the office. So in addition to the physical plant, um, making that create um, warm and inviting, it, it's how we're greeting people as well. 
on that same theme, that do you want to talk a little bit about the wa welcoming walkthroughs, Donna? Mm -hmm. So the state of Connecticut also offers to you um, a program called Welcoming Atmosphere Walkthrough. And, and what we do is bring that to your town. And so we've done it in Middletown at all of our schools. And what it is is really a checklist where we bring parents, staff, and community members together and students at, at the high school level. And we walk through the building. Um, it takes about an hour and a half to walk through the building with this checklist. And we're evaluating the physical environment, the procedures and policies, the welcoming staff, and the written materials um, and websites. And so it's a quick checklist. You get a, you know, kind of like a grade at the end. Um, and also at the end, then we create an action plan. And that action plan has really been very helpful for the people that come together to then have a direction. Um, we've used it with the governance councils, which many of you had, um, with PTA. But what I see um, when we do the walkthroughs at all the schools is that the process is just as important as the end product. Um, the process that we're willing to um, walk through the school, um, we're inviting parents and staff to, to evaluate these things, has really been very um, uplifting for the people involved. And then the action steps, I can't say enough about the change that these people had, especially um, you know, if you have a governance council or if you have a PTA, these people have been elected. They want to be involved and they want to be effective and make change. And with this tool, they actually, um, one of our middle schools started a uh, honor society, which they never had before. Um, our middle school and high school, of course, you know, there were some physical things that, that they've been asking for for a while, but with this action plan at the end, it helped move that agenda. Um, I can't say enough about going through the process, how it has really helped all of us really improve the climate. And also what you see is, you know, at the elementary schools, we're very nurturing and welcoming. And, um, and when you go to the middle school and high school and kind of look at the same things, you, you don't really see it. it. It might just be signs and names on the door and updated bulletin boards. But all those things say to families, you know, you're welcome here and we want you to come in. So. Or even pictures. Right? Yes, um, yes. Pictures. If there's pictures, if, if, for example, Janet, in your school, if the majority population of the students right. are African American, but the um, the stock pictures are. There you go. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Exactly. And that's actually some of the things that that we look for. Right. And that that was a very apropos statement because we want our children to see themselves. Correct. And and have an accurate picture of who they are and what they can be. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, canvases throughout our building of events that we've taken, uh, of, of pictures we've taken during events, and we post them throughout the building so that whenever we have the learning walks or the um, Department of Ed comes through and walks through, they'll see the children that respect the space because they see themselves in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We ha I had one principal um, in a very, uh, majority district um, of minority students and where the principal actually, the PTO actually paid for um, a, a photographer to come in and the families came through and took pictures and then the, um, of the families. And the families then, the family photos were then put on the walls of the, of the hallways. And then the children, the families could take pictures, the pictures home as well. So instead of having just stock pictures, we had, like you said, genuine, authentic pictures of the families in the school. When you walk through our halls in East Hartford, you will see just that. We have in our central office, our, each of our buildings has pictures of our children, and it means a lot to the kids and to the families as well. Sharon, I wanted you to just um, give you an opportunity to speak about the Boundless Playground. Yes, absolutely. We have um, a petition from one of our elementary schools to consider what is called a, a boundless playground. We're in the early stages of investigating uh, this opportunity for children and, and we really are looking toward um, engaging our families and the parent organizations in this particular elementary school. It is the elementary school that houses our medically fragile program. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with what a boundless playground is, but it's an opportunity for children with disabilities, in particular multiple disabilities, 
children who may be in wheelchairs to ac access a, a playground environment. It's a playground where children are safe and they can interact with children um, who have other disabilities as well as typical peers. So again, we're looking forward to exploring that. And before I move off, Janet, I just wanted to um, give you an opportunity to speak about how you help transition new, new students with disabilities. Um, thank you. I, I also want to recognize the Director of uh, Pupil Personnel Services for the New Haven Public Schools who is here. So I can't, you know, I can't toot my own horn, <laughs> but the fact that she was able and willing to work so closely um, with me when I'm sometimes really passionate about <laughs> what I need and when I want it. Um, but she's been able to, she was willing to um, do whatever it takes for us to continue our building on culture and climate in our school. Um, one of the things that Dr. Rodriguez talked um, pervasively about and that we talked about whenever we <laughs> met was relationship. And the fact is children and parents don't care what you know until they know you care. Sure. And having said that, everybody's schedule doesn't accommodate the regular PPT schedule. And if you're going to build relationships and partnerships, partnership means that it fits together. We held a PPT this summer for a family that we wanted to be able to give an opportunity to see the building, to be comfortable with the building, to hear what the concerns are of the parent to hear what the disability is that the child had. And just not having a PPT just on Tuesdays or Thursdays, but any time that's going to fit into the um, schematica of the family. And then to make certain that the family is not inconvenienced. A lot of our families travel by bus. Why are you going to have them catch the bus to and from four times in one month when you can have a meeting maybe one time and then just spend the time to address the needs and concerns. So those are the kinds of things that undergird and support building family engagement. And that brings us to question number two, which is how do you build relationships with families? And I, I see Donna kind of like inching there. So Donna, you want to take that question? Sure. Um, I really work on partnerships. And in, in Middletown, we are very fortunate to have many partnerships with um, churches, with the colleges and universities, with um, any our faith-based partners, um, with businesses, the Community Health Center, Middlesex Hospital, and, and that's a great opportunity. And we have some special programs. Um, one of them is called um, the Ministry Alliance. They have a partnership with many of our schools. And so we have a minister that is in the school that runs a program called All Pro Dads. And it's a very simple breakfast with your, um, your male role model, whoever that might be. It might be a dad, a grandpa, an uncle, um, and the child. And we do this once a month and a few of our schools. And um, it's our ministry partners that leads this program. And it, it's just simple. They're having a little conversation together. You can look up allprodads.com. It has a, a simple little curriculum, but it's a conversation. Um, it, and it starts usually with this month, why were you proud of um, your child. And then the dad will also say, you know, this month, why were you proud of me? And they have this little conversation. And then we usually see a little video on a, our particular topic. Um, but that time when the, the dads come together with their children, it's very different. It's not like when the moms come together. The male role, I, like I kind of stand in the background and it, it's their thing. You know, we make, we make sure that we have you know, meat and eggs and, you know, party <laughs> food. Um, it, it's, it's different. There's, there's a lot going on there. But, you know, you know that, that moms and women communicate differently that, that with their children that, than dads do. And so this has been a great way for us to build relationships with these families. And we're seeing different parents and different family members come into the school that we haven't seen before. And, and then we take that back to um, our climate committees. Our ministry alliance is part of some of those climate committees, and when we're talking about a family that we're trying to reach or trying to be, build a relationship with, a lot of times it's that minister partner that's the first one to knock on the door, or a different partner. It's not always the, the principal that not, has to knock on the door. So that, that's really very important. And I'm going to talk about one other thing yes. that we do to build yep. relationships. Um, Middletown has a bookmobile, which is a grassroots program started by a parent 
who is a graduate of our parent leadership programs. They have to do a project. She decided to do this bookmobile. And the bookmobile actually um, gives out books to families um, throughout the town in the summer in, in the neighborhoods. And the bookmobile is this renovated mail van that um, actually uh, you, it's used for the mail van during the year. But during the summer, the principals and staff members drive this van and go to the neighborhoods. And over the past four years, we've given out more than 5,000 books. And we just give them to children. And this year, we got music on the van. And um, even one of the school songs. So when we go to their neighborhood, we play the school song. <laughs> and, um, and, and I can't tell you, it, it just cracks me up to see kids are running to get books. It's like, we, we are not giving out ice cream. We are giving out books. And they're just as engaged. And we've brought in other partners. The Girl Scouts and Boy, Boy Scouts meet the van. United Way has met the van. Everyone's collecting books for us. So it's quite a way to really build relationships in an informal way out there in the neighborhoods. When we talk about parent involvement, you know, that's kind of like one way, one way we talk about hard to reach parents. You know, are they hard to reach or are we hard to reach? And this bookmobile has given us the opportunity to go out there to have informal conversations where they are and everyone is just so excited about it. Go ahead. Um, in East Hartford, last year we decided as a way to engage our families and get to know them better and to have them see our staff as um, approachable and, and happy to be with them, we uh, instituted a family resource fair. And we invited community partners, our, our mental health organization, our YMCA, the Children's Services and the Public Library, uh, we had our birth to three program present, uh, the, the um, uh, Hartford Current Kids Camp, and we had booths available so that <clears throat> families uh, could learn about more resources. We had pizza. Um, we also had entertainment. We had a demonstration uh, wheelchair ballroom dancing. We just had a lot of activities, and it was an opportunity for our families to get us to get to know us in a more informal setting, but the one thing I want to share, as I saw families come in that night, I was truly amazed at the number of families we had in attendance, because we all know that it can be difficult to bring families out. Our, our lives are busy, their lives are busy. But I think key in getting our families out that night was that each of the case managers took the opportunity to look at their caseload and to contact the families on their caseload and to personally invite them to come to the fair. And I really think that was um, in part why we had such a, a huge success. We're now in the process of um, getting ready for our next fair this November. And um, the interest in the community is just tremendous. So we're really looking forward to that. But I just want to share also that um, I truly work with and am honored to work with the, the greatest team of administrators and, and staff I can share with you that I have a principal of our, um, one of our programs who has her cell phone with her 24-7, and she is available to talk with families whenever they need her. And I think that that demonstrates to families the authenticity and, and the care. Um, I've had my district inclusion facilitator go out with a family of a student with autism who was not happy about going to the dentist and she actually went on a dental visit. I have supervisors who will go out in the evening to meet with families because the family just can't make it in during the school day. So these are all things that enter into a family's perception of who we are as individuals and that we're there to work with them and to be there for them. Thank you. Um, I, one of the things that made this relationship, partnership, whatever you like to call it, um, so meaningful is to hear the different strategies that have been employed and how they are so similar across um, districts and, and across socioeconomic lines. Um, we have a parental engagement activity every month. And the way I can share with you that we know our uh, parental engagement activities are successful or having our parents come into the school is successful when I was named principal in uh, May of 2014, they had a meet the principal night where they ordered 20 pizzas. 10 people came. Mm -hmm. 
a real ego boost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and when we had our first parental engagement night in September, we called it alphabet soup. And I made this humongous vat of homemade chicken alphabet soup. We had over 150 parents there. <laughs> and the purpose of that night was to explain all of the acronyms that they hear tossed at them so that that would inform them and empower them mm -hmm. to take charge mm -hmm. and be in control when they sit in these meetings. Um, we had a Bill Gingerbread House night where over 350 families came out or 350 people came out. And all we did was sell gingerbread packets for a dollar where you take graham crackers and marshmallows and icing and build gingerbread houses. We had a uh, My Girl, My Guy dance um, <laughs> where girls could bring the significant male figure in their lives. Boys could bring the significant female figure in their lives. I had parents angry with me because their children chose another adult. <laughs> but we had, we had, <laughs> and, and it's consistently been that we have to have police presence to control traffic, not because something's bad going on, you understand? Yeah. Um, and our students, they just enjoy seeing their parents being involved in school, and it makes the students' behaviors better, right. because in my day, all right. it took was my mother saying, yeah. you better not make me come. <laughs> yeah. right. But today, when our students see our parents in the building, it makes them say, well, I never know when they're going to stop in, so maybe I need to keep it together on a more consistent basis. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to add to that. I can't say enough about that comprehensive approach that you just had. I mean, we, pro we provide some wonderful programs, maybe for parents in the evening, but we have to think about being social marketers. We have to market just like everyone else is marketing to our families. They're busy. And so how do we hook them in to saying, we got the best thing going on tonight, you should come. So things like you said, like you know, the food, of course, but have, include the children when you're having a family night. Um, have them perform, have them receive awards, then your parents are gonna come. But, but really think yeah. about that invitation. And there needs to be multiple invitations, whether it's a written one or um, having the children create the invitation, making the children part of the process to bring the families in really will help you increase that participation in any event you have. Don't forget about social media. We have Facebook and Twitter and we got to use them all. Remember all the other marketers out there are using them all and so you have to make your event just as attractive as everyone else's. Donna, can you speak a little bit about the parent leadership training and particularly the percentage of special ed um, mm -hmm. uh, folks that end up there? So in, in Middletown, throughout the state of Connecticut, there's opportunities for parents to take um, programs in parent leadership that help parents become civically engaged and become leading advocates for not only their children, but all children. So a lot of times when people come, they say, I want to take this because I have a child with special needs. It's really broader than that. We're giving them skills to really move agendas and to affect change for, for all children. But we have, I have noticed over the past 15 years we've offered them in Middletown and Middlesex County, more than 50% of the participants come to the table when you ask them why do you want to take this. It's because they have a child with special needs and they want to ramp up their skills or they want to share their experience and help others work through the process and have the, the skills to help